Good morning once again, Shiloh High School youth. I hope that you're doing well. Happy 4th of July weekend. I hope you had a great weekend with your family. Hopefully you're able to spend a little bit of time outside, maybe gone for a hike or gone for a walk or ride a bike around the block or whatever it is. Spend some time by the pool. Uh, whatever you did as a family, I hope that it went well. Uh, I hope that you got out of the house a little bit, got a little bit of sun, uh, but most of all, you're able just to enjoy each other and enjoy your families. I hope that you're safe. I hope that you're healthy as well. We continue to look forward to being able to come back together once again as a church, as our church continues to get healthy and as we continue to, to get through this uh, COVID-19 season. Uh, we are hoping, we're praying, we're anticipating being able to come back on August the 2nd, join together once again, celebrate together, and be together as a church family. I know that there's a lot of things that change day to day, and so I'm going to continue to keep you updated through emails, through text messages, and let you know as things continue to get planned through the month of July. I will let you know this week, early on in the week, what our Wednesday night is going to look like this week. Originally, we had a theme night planned, and I'm not sure uh, as of right now if we're going to be able to get back here on campus for that event. I will let you know that tomorrow, Tuesday at the latest. If we don't do something on campus, we'll do something over Zoom once again, maybe do some film and theology, uh, but I'll let you know. So check your email. I'll send you a text message out right away as well once that email goes out and keep you informed and keep you up to date on what's going on in our high school ministry. If you have any needs, if there's anything that we can do to help you out, help your family out, please don't hesitate to let me know. This morning, we're going to continue our series on the fruit of the Spirit. We're working our way through. We're working our way on how God changes us and how when God changes us from the inside out through His Holy Spirit that lives within us, as He puts the nature and the character of God within us, develops that, matures that within us, allows us to live that out, how that affects our relationships with other people, building healthy relationships by living out the fruit of the Spirit. This morning, we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit of goodness. The fruit of the Spirit of goodness, we, of course, we find the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, it's that contrast between walking in the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of your flesh, Paul lists out with those some of those examples of the works of the flesh or the deeds of the flesh or the desires of the flesh are. Contrast that again with what the fruit of the Spirit is and then follows up the end of that passage, just reminding us that those that live by the Spirit must walk in the Spirit. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit within us and we have an example through the Holy Spirit that guides us. We follow Him, follow in His footsteps, and he leads us on those paths that are healthy and safe and make a difference, not only in our lives, but in other people's lives as well. This morning, as we look at the fruit of the spirit of goodness, let's stop and let's pray. And then we'll look at what God's word says about that. God, thanks. Thanks for today. Thank you for these students. And I pray, God, that you would continue to watch over them. I pray that you would continue to bless them, that you would continue to protect them. God, I pray for their health and their safety. And I pray, God, that you would continue to grow in them the spirit that lives within you, that, God, you would continue to mature them, that they would walk in your ways, that they would follow your example, they would follow your steps. And, God, as we look at goodness today, I pray, God, that you would reveal to us what that means and how we can live out that character and that nature of God that you've placed within us through your Holy Spirit to develop, to mature, and to reproduce to affect other people's lives. So God, speak to us today. Help us to learn what we need to learn. Help us to put into practice what we need to practice. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our faith-building thought this morning, thinking about goodness and as reflecting on some of the verses and some of the points that we're gonna look at here in just a second. Here's the faith-building thought. It's true with goodness. It's also true with all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit as well. When the fruit of the Spirit is something we merely do, the effects on us and others will be temporary. When the fruit of the Spirit is something that comes from God transforming us to His original design, the effects are long-lasting and are even eternal. When the fruit of the Spirit is just something that we try to do, we just try to do love and joy and peace and patience and goodness, 
kindness. When we try to just do those things as, a, as we're checking them off, yep, did love, did joy, did peace. Not so much on kindness, not so great on patience, goodness I'm okay on. If we just have that scale, it's going to be temporary. But when we realize that it's something that God wants to develop in our lives, when we realize that these fruit are characteristics of God's nature himself that he puts within us, the effects are going to be long-lasting. They're going to be eternal. That we recognize that him developing these things in our lives is part of restoring his original design for his children to restore the original design that he had when he created mankind. And that's the first point that I have on here, is that the original goodness, the original goodness comes from God. It was part of creation. God declared creation was good. And when he created mankind and he looked around, he said, it is very good. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, but in, he goes through the, the days of creation. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate waters from the waters. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and the morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And it was good. And God saw that it was good. And he said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruit which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let the lights be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth and let the uh, expanse of the heavens. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. You see, original creation. From the heavens to the earth, from all the things in the sky to all the creatures in the land and the sea, from the plants and the trees to mankind himself, male and female, reflected the image and the goodness and the completeness and the character and the nature of God. And it was very good. The original design, the original creation was very good. Mankind was created very good. Creation was created very good because it reflected the character and the nature and the image of God. That's the good news, but then there's a broken goodness that took place. Not long after that creation, of course, we see sin entering the world. Sin was selfish. Mankind is very bad. We see in Genesis 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the fields that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and hid themselves in the loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You see, the original design, the original goodness, the original reflection of God's character and nature was broken when sin entered the world. Sin was selfish. Satan questioned and allowed Adam and Eve to question the very character, to, the character of God. Did he really say that? Is God really a truthful God? Was God hiding something from you? He questioned the character of God. He also questioned the motive of God. Oh, God just wants to keep you from knowing everything that he knows. He questioned the motive of God, and then he questioned the authority of God. God just wants to keep you from being like him. He knows that when you eat of that, he's going to be like, you, like God himself. He questioned the character of God, questioned the motive of God, questioned the authority of God. And in our broken creation, in our broken goodness, in our sinful self, mankind is very bad because ever since that day, mankind has been driven by those three desires to question God's character, to question God's motives, and to question God's authority. And we see that. We see that in me. We see that in you. We see that in our culture. We see that in our society, that we're questioning those things about God. We carry out those desires through the lust of the flesh. Someone has something that I don't have, therefore I have to have it. We follow through with the lust of the eyes. It looks good. It looks pleasing. And I have to have it. And I have to have it now. And the pride of life. Somebody else is telling me what I can or can't do or can or can't have. Therefore, I have to have it. I have to do it. No one can tell me what to do. The pride of life. In our brokenness, in our broken goodness, in our sinfulness, we function questioning God's character. We function questioning God's motives. We function questioning God's authority. That's broken goodness. But you know, there's a restored goodness aspect as well. God himself wanted to restore that goodness. And he started that process the very day that he confronted Adam and Eve with their sin. That very day that he came to them and they were hiding after sowing fig leaves together for themselves and hiding in the bushes. God started restoring this goodness. He made for them garments of skin and he clothed them, we read in Genesis 3. Then he kicked them out of the garden. And you may say, well, that doesn't sound very restorative. Is that a word? I don't even know. It doesn't sound like he's trying to restore anything by kicking them out. But he was protecting them because then he put an angel around the tree of life because he knew that if Adam and Eve then ate of the tree of life, there would be no chance for them to be restored, no chance for them to be redeemed. In fact, we see the tree of life in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 is the last time we see it in Genesis. The next time we read about the tree of life is in the book of Revelation chapter 21 where we see that tree of life in heaven that those that follow Jesus will be eating from for eternity and eternity. You see, he started this restoration process through a sacrifice to cover them by removing them from the garden so that he can restore them, so that he could get his plan of restoration uh, continuing in motion. He started it right after they sinned and continued it along. Isaiah 53 tells us all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. That's our sinfulness. But 
the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see this restored goodness is through salvation, and salvation is very gracious. It's something that we don't earn or deserve. It's God making Jesus to take on our sin because we couldn't pay for it ourselves. What started in Genesis chapter 3 through the first sacrifice was fulfilled, was prophesied through the book of Isaiah and was fulfilled through the person of Jesus Christ. John 3.16 is a very familiar verse. But it talks about not only this salvation that's so gracious, but the mankind that's so lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let me keep reading. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I'd encourage you guys, read that again this week. Don't just read verse 16. Read verses 17 and 18 as well. And then this is verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil broken goodness, sinful humanity. Man is very, very lost. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. There's a restoration that takes place because man is lost. In ourselves, we're lost. In our humanity, we're lost. It took God to come down in the form of Jesus, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty of our sin, for us to turn from our sin and to be saved, to be restored, to be renewed by surrendering ourselves to him, by confessing Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in the order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, salvation is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And if we don't have that restoration, we continue to live in our brokenness. We continue to live in that broken goodness. And I'm not saying that we can't do good things, that unsaved people can't do good things because they can but in the end, the motive is impure. In the end, their desires are impure. In the end, it revolves more about them and fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and not about reflecting God because God's not within them. Not about restoring the goodness that was God's original plan because God is not in them. It's only through salvation that we can properly reflect and pursue the goodness of God and his original desire, what he originally desired us to have. It's only through salvation that we can experience the power of the Holy Spirit living out the nature and the character of God throughout our lives. It's only through salvation that we can have the fruit of the Spirit placed and grown and matured and reproduced within us. It's only through salvation that we can experience and express practical goodness. God tells us, we looked at uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. It says to let our good works shine before men so that they may see your good works and will praise your Father that's in heaven. This practical goodness for a follower of Jesus is about pointing people to God, about reflecting God into other people's lives. It's practical goodness. Once we've been changed, once we've been restored, once we have God's goodness within us and reproduced within us, then we can live that out. And in practical goodness, love is essential because mankind is very needy. Love is essential. I've mentioned a couple of times in our, in our messages, but I, I like to listen to the Sports Spectrum podcast. 
This week I was listening to one of the episodes and they were talking to a, uh, a lady who was on The View and she was on ABC News uh, and Good Morning America and she walked away from that. But they were talking about uh, her life and kind of her transformation and kind of what God was doing in her life. And she said, you know, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of being on The View, in the midst of being in Good Morning America and uh, working in the ABC News industry, she said she was able to have a lot of conversations about Jesus with people because she said, you have to lead with love. If you lead with love, people will listen. If you lead with love, we earn the right to be heard. If we lead with love, people will respond. People will, will sit down at the table. The Bible does tell us to speak the truth, but to speak the truth in love. We like to speak the truth, or we like to speak in love. We have a hard time putting those things together. We have to speak the truth, but it has to begin with love. It has to be, be flavored with love. It has to be seasoned with salt, the scriptures say, so that we know how to respond, and we respond in love. We've looked at that verse in, in John uh, chapter 13 so many times, but you're going to keep hearing it. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Practical goodness, love is essential. Mankind is needy and they're going to respond and they're going to listen because of love. 1 John 4 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God. He who does not love does not know God. God is building that within us. We looked at that when we talked about the fruit of the Spirit of love. And again, 1 John asks us, how can we say we love God who we haven't seen when we hate our brothers who we do see? The answer for the goodness that this world is looking for is found in the love of God that is lived out through his followers. The answer for this restored goodness that the world is looking for that our culture is looking for, that your friends are looking for, and might I even say that you're looking for, is found in the love of God. And it's the love that the followers of Jesus are gonna directly show and give to other people. If you're looking for that restored goodness, look at the love of God. Look at how much God loves you. Look at how much God cares for you. And as you look around our culture, and as you look around our society, and as you look all around the things that are happening in our lives, your friends, our community is crying out for restored goodness. It is only going to be found through God's people showing love. Through God's people showing this restored goodness that they've experienced in their life. By God's people reaching out with the love of Jesus to, to the other people. That's what these, I believe, that's what these protests are all about. People looking for restored goodness and not finding them anywhere and having to, to follow through in their own desires and in their own lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and pride of life, trying to find this restored goodness, banding together of like-minded people trying to find this restoration, but it can only be found through Jesus, and they're only going to know it through you and I sharing Jesus' love with each other. You and I sharing Jesus' love with them. You and I sharing Jesus' love to everyone. We need to do that. We need to be the reflection. We have to be the reflection of that practical goodness after we've been restored and we have to lead with love. We have to lead with the love of Jesus Christ. What the world is looking for can only be found through Jesus and they're only gonna know it through you and I loving them the way Jesus loves them. You and I looking at other people as Jesus looks at other people, as needing to be restored, needing to experience his love, needing to experience his goodness. You and I must take the news of God's love and God's goodness 
to a world that's longing for it. And we have to lead with love because that's what Jesus leads with. That's what God leads with. For God so loved the world. We have to lead with love as we live out this practical goodness that God's put within us. It's what the world's looking for. It's what our community's looking for. It's what your schools are looking for. It's what your friends are looking for. Lead with love and live out practical goodness to others. And finally, we look forward to the day when we're going to experience fulfilled goodness. Heaven will be perfect. Redeemed mankind will be fully restored. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these are the words of trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride of the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from the heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance, like the most rare jewel, like, like jasper, clear as crystal. And I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. And its lamp is the Lamb, and by its light will walk the nations. The kings of the earth will bring to their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it. No anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Fulfilled goodness is heaven. And it's going to be experienced by the nations. It's going to be experienced by people from all around the world, from every tribe and every tongue and every nation that has experienced the goodness of God personally, whose names are written in the book of life. And in that city, in heaven, in that ultimate fulfillment, will be men and women and children of all ages, of all tribes, of all tongues, and all nations, and will be worshiping the Lord together because we've all experienced the goodness of God and the love of God and the transformation of God and the salvation of God through the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But until God's ultimate goodness is fulfilled, his goodness has to be reflected out by his children, and that's you and me. His goodness must shine brightly through those he has transformed. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he's transformed you. He wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He's in that process of transforming you. His goodness has to be shined out through us. His goodness must be carried out for, by those who bear his name, by those who are indwelt by his Holy Spirit. As followers of Jesus, we must bear the goodness of God. And we have no excuse because he's restoring what originally was his design and he's using you and me to do that. Those that follow Jesus, those that have been changed by Jesus, those who've been transformed by Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. Goodness is something we are because God is good. 
Goodness is something that we bring transformed and shining out and growing in our lives because that's the character and the nature of God that's within us. Goodness is something that the world desires and can only be found through Jesus. So let's take that to them. Let's take God's goodness to them and let's remember to lead with love. Let's pray. God, thanks. Thanks for this reminder of your original design. Thanks for your reminder of your original creation. And God, I pray that myself, these students, that all that are watching this, God, we'd commit to allowing you to transform our lives, that we would live out your goodness, that we would shine out your goodness into a world that so desperately is longing for it. And that, God, we would lead with love. We would lead with understanding. We'd lead with compassion because that's how you led. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So God, help us to reflect that goodness, to live out that goodness, to be transformed by that goodness, and to share that goodness with others. I know that we can do it because you live within us, and that's your desire, and that's what you're making us to be. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for changing us. Thanks for giving us your goodness. Thanks for leading with love to us. Help us to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I hope you guys have a great week. Again, I'll be letting you know early on, either Monday or Tuesday, what Wednesday night is going to look like, as well as some of the other things coming up this month. Again, it's kind of on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis right now, uh, but I'll continue to keep you informed. Continue to check your email. Continue to check your text messages. Continue to reach out to others. If you need anything, reach out to me. I miss you guys. Look forward to seeing you again. God bless. Have a great week.